We've been joined on Sunrise Daily by um, Dr. Modupe Adifesho Olateju. He's a policy expert just to my right, and she has uh, been the vice chair of the technical committee which designed and organized the Nigeria Economic Summit, NESG 20, on education held in 2014. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Also to my extreme right is uh, Ola Wumi Gasper. He is indeed a former rector, Lagos State Polytechnic. Thank you for coming as well. Thank you. Well, let's start with you, doctor, because um, <clears throat> when you look at the complexity of the strings of malpractices that seem to be the order of the day for JAM, or the UTME, if you will, when and how did we get to this point? Well, thank you for that question. I think it's a great question. I think it's a great way to start the conversation. I think the first thing to understand is that JAM is an inordinately high-stakes examination. It is viewed as a do-or-die affair. Yesterday, I was reading in the newspaper about a young man who had written JAM three times, um, and on his fourth try, had finally found a sponsor to um, facilitate you know, his... Uh, enrollment and the fourth time he scored I think 163 and so he went on Facebook yesterday and said well he's going to teach people how to drink sniper because he's going to kill himself so jam is very very high stakes and why is this so jam is high stakes because a lot of Nigerian young people do not believe that there are options when it comes to academic and professional progression except through the root of the universities predominantly and then secondarily through polytechnics, colleges of education, and more recently, the um, IEIs as well. Now, the reality of the matter is that if we start from the very foundation, we realize that the quality of education is extremely low in Nigeria. We conduct a survey in the organization that I work with. And in 2017, 2018, we found across the country, haven't sampled about 40 and tested 40,000 children in six states representing the geopolitical spread of Nigeria. We found that only 59% of children who are 15 years old were able to pass an assessment that was targeted at children in primary two. And we developed this assessment with the curriculum development body, the Federal Ministry of Education, state ministries, Universal Basic Education Commission, National Population Commission, National Bureau of, I mean, we conduct, this was a rigorous assessment. 59% of 15-year-olds. What does that tell us? It tells us that those that make it to the WIAC level are much, much better off than the vast majority of Nigerians. And those that make it to JAM are the best that we have. Yet, look at JAM results. On average, 35 to 40% pass rates in JAM. That's like going to the market to buy 10 oranges. And then you get back home and realize six of your oranges are bad. What will people ask you? Did you not open your eyes when you went to the market to buy oranges? So we're not getting returns on our investment in education. So obviously these are very, very poor products of the education system. Those that make it through JAM are the best. Now, how many people can actually be accommodated in university? That's a big okay. question. Well, you know, well, uh, let me, let me let's, if you don't let's mind, get yeah. the views of... Yes, of, I, okay. I, I wanted to ask her, Mr. Mr. Gaspar, as an examiner first, what would be your first take on uh, what uh, the professor said? To me, it's very unfortunate. Um, as an examiner, my practice is, it's been on for quite a long time, special centers and all that, streaming students into doing German, having um, high figures and uh, but even the question and the question is even while those kids are in the university is it a true representation of the scores they, they had the answer is no which we've seen severally and again like like she said we have overemphasized university education unfortunately enough for us the society itself is guilty we've neglected all other tasks of education especially the primary education the primary education is the hub. It's the major hub for individual and societal development. It's also the pivot on which all the tiers of education really. So we, 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 we have to emphasize primary education that can produce for us the young Nigerian child who is going to be innovative, 
who is going to be creative, who is who we who we are going to give the opportunities or the you know the, the potential of that child in the education cycle must be identified early enough. So that while you're streaming, you know well this is a creative, this is innovative, this is an exceptionally gifted child, move to the junior school, move to the secondary school, like we do have in other clients in the, in the Nordic nations. It's not, it's not you go to academy for sports, you go to academy for media, you go to academy for music. That's what you do because yeah, I, I, those I, I, potentials have been identified early enough. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, you know, when you were talking about, you know, the <coughs> academics and all of that, you know, it's a good thing, but I was going to ask you, do we have the kind of curriculum that develops other strengths other than academics? You know, curriculum is not the issue in this. Honestly, curriculum is the, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the lowest hanging. Okay. I mean, you can pick a curriculum from anywhere and domesticate. Once you agree, this is the route you're going. Once you agree, this is your pathway. If we agree, we're going to emphasize on primary education, aligning with the curriculum from where we have best practices is not an issue. So then, madam, it's a question of policy, not just curriculum? I think it's a question, yes, I think it's fundamentally a question of policy implementation. And in some regards, maybe some legislation as well. I think it's quite important to look at it from that perspective. As Engineer Gasper has rightly said, um, curriculum is perhaps not the most pressing issue right now. Um, what, because at the end of the day, what is a curriculum? A curriculum is right. a framework. Yeah. A curriculum is, okay, uh, this is where we want to go as a nation. So what sort of skills do we need to imbibe in our young people to get us there? So we can craft a curriculum. Delivery of the curriculum is another matter. And the reality is that even as deficient as our curriculum is in Nigeria today, <clears throat> it is still not being delivered. No. I mean, we want, you need to look at the data on teacher competence. And I say this with every sense of respect and um, honor for people who work in our classrooms every day. We do have very, very low competence levels. Okay. A survey was conducted that showed <clears throat> that less than 1% of teachers were competent to teach to primary Four and six. Less than one percent. Less <laughs> than one percent. I'll tell you the exact number. Seven out of nineteen thousand. Uh, you're saying we have a figure of about seven to nineteen thousand teachers in a particular state that went through this examination, uh, through this test, and were unable to. To uh, th those are the results that we that we got. Mm -hmm. One could liken to this to what happened in um, Kaduna State, where the governor had to rejig or should I say put the teachers on the test just so that he can see and know the level of education that the people, should I say the kids in Kaduna State are getting. What more did you find? I think it's really interesting because um, it's, it's, it's very important to link learner outcomes to teacher outcomes. Um, and when the surveys were conducted and they were funded you know, by the Department for International Development, um, it really shone the light on what teacher competence levels were across the country. The challenge is, what do you do with that data? Do you simply fire the teachers? Or do you begin to dig deep into what the root causes of this sort of result might be and begin to institute programs at policy level, or thinking at policy level, which is then implemented to reform this system? For us, that's the fundamental issue. Because these results that we saw were not actually the worst results. There were states that had worse results than this. You know, so we begin to ask ourselves questions like, where do teachers typically come from in Nigeria? Um, today, when we ask ourselves who passes JAM and progresses on to, who passes WAEC and, pa and progresses on to JAM level, the question is, the answer is, it's people who have scored five credits in WAEC, including math and English. However, there are many that don't score five credits. There are many that score three and four credits. And they are welcomed with open arms by guess who? The Colleges of Education. But, but this government, um, uh, is, is this to do with government schools or is it private as well, the statistics that you really know? These statistics are mostly in private schools, in public schools. Because with private schools, um, governments across the country have had a very tough time being able to identify um, being able to regulate what happens in the private sector. 
um, but we do have data from the public sector in terms of teacher competence. Uh, uh, Engineer Gaspar, you, you are also not just an examiner, but also an administrator. How do you handle such issues? You have such figures. Well, <laughs> so the such figures, especially at the primary school level, it's, uh, it's not um, happening at all. It's not happening at all because, like you rightly said, are you going to dismiss them? Are you going to get them off the roll? Let's are even assume that are it's you going to uh, train them? Yeah, let's even assume that it's a tertiary, you know, a level which you govern. Okay. You know, how, how, how do you handle it? Well, at the tertiary level, I'm not too sure we have it as bad as this. But if we do, if we do, I mean, the, well, to me, it's difficult to have such a thing at the tertiary level because um, our recruitment uh, process is a... Uh, a bit very rigid. So then, uh, that's so you have very good teachers, very but good. Uh, not not so good students. So uh, well, it's, it's they are talking about the teachers. Yes, one can say because of the recruitment process, which requires for anybody to come into a tertiary to have a minimum of a master's degree, which is going to be an assistant lecturer cadre, and you know you move down the line. So basically, and. Um, like you very well know in the tertiary is an apprenticeship system. Yeah. You keep, you keep um, uh, working, being supervised by, you know, a senior lecturer or by a professor as you go along uh, to have your PhD and all that. I mean, it's not as if we, have, we, don't, have some, we don't have some issues also in tertiary. Yeah. Uh, we do. But it's not as bad as the primary school, which is the foundation. And that was why I was mentioning to say, look, the foundation is we have to all go back to that foundation, which is the primary school. Okay. And honestly, we have, I, I must say it right here, we, not need to, we need to rejig the constitution, look at the constitution, review the constitution, primary education must be free compulsory, which it is today, but it must be on the exclusive list of the federal government. Mm. Only the federal government should deliver primary education, and federal government should hands off. Secondary, what do you mean by federal government should hands off? Hands off secondary, technical, and tertiary. That's, that is what is done, is done in, in most of the Nordic countries. should focus on the primary. Only primary education. Free, and compulsory. On the polytechnics and the universities. Polytechnics, university, states, private sector, foundations, all the like should take on that. Okay, let's, so that, let's, let's, let's Because focus. Once, the, once we get the foundation right, once we get the primary education right, the rest is transition to other tiers. You, you said it's not about... Oh, oh, please. Um, <coughs> let's focus on that primary yeah. segment that you talked about because Professor Isha Koloidi, the JAM Registrar, is very concerned about this and the level of malpractices that's happening there. What must we do? Is it a fear for JAM that is affecting students? If we introduce a situation where they are allowed to bring in textbooks, for instance, to write this examination. Meanwhile, of course, the examination setters know fully well what you need to do, yeah. not necessarily trying to see if you are passing an exam, but to assess your knowledge. knowledge. Will that work? Why not? I don't see, it's to, to me, I don't see why a candidate should not take a textbook to the exam hall or room. You, you're timed. You, if you waste your time looking at the textbook and looking for the solution, your one hour is gone, your one and a half hours is gone. It's a test of knowledge, like you rightly say. If I know the source of the knowledge, quickly I go for it, and then right on my system, I click. 12, I go to 13, I go to 14. There's nothing. But to me, you will not have any, you won't have any change whether you take any textbook or you don't take any textbook. Honestly, hmm. it's knowledge. Madam, you, you, t you talked about the policy <coughs> shortcoming. Uh, the, the policy gap that we have, and not just the policy gap, but the policy implementation gap. For how long have we had this issue, and what will it take to resolve it? Put that in perspective. The last time we sat down as a country to define where our education system should be as a function of where our national development should be, and had a strategic conversation around what our curriculum should be doing for us as a country, was in September 1969. In September 2019, it will be 50 years since we sat down to have that conversation. I'll be frank with you. If we had any other outcomes besides what we're currently seeing in Nigeria today, I would be shocked. 
Because what we're reaping, we've sown the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. I don't want to come across as a purveyor of doom and gloom, but we have to look at the evidence before us. When we talk about policy, let's give an example. Four years ago, we had a new policy regarding trade, the trade subjects, you know, at secondary school level. Because the realization is that universities cannot be accessed by everyone and should not be accessed by everyone. Therefore, since the GSS 6334 system had failed, where we were supposed to be developing technical skills by the end of GSS 3, therefore there was another push to introduce 34 trade subjects into the senior secondary curriculum. Now, how much thinking went into that? Are there any teacher training courses that prepare young people in colleges of education today to teach photography? No, there are none. So how do you expect a teacher to deliver photography classes when there is no institution in the country that is training teachers to teach photography? So we are not serious as a country. And we are, I, I don't want to castigate us all, but I believe that lack of intellectual rigor, the way that we plan our policies, is responsible for the failure of the implementation of our policies. But if we backtrack, yes. we can get it right. Where if we, we backtrack, from? we can get it right. There are pockets of good practice. Yeah, yeah. When we look across states, we see that there's some states that are beginning to take this issue very seriously. Look at Edo State, for example. They may not be ticking all the boxes, but they are showing that they are serious about developing the capacity of their teachers. They are serious about technology, for example, and teachers being able to leap into the 21st century and carry their students with them. If you look across the country, even in Sokoto State, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, there are pockets of good practice. The if question you, is, can we scale these pockets of good practice? If you were with the members of the House of Reps and you are making a presentation now with a view to uh, talking about those policies that you say must be addressed first, if we're to get it right from the, from the root cause of all of these uh, malpractices that we're seeing from the primary level, uh, from, I'm sorry, the secondary school level to the tertiary institutions, what would you be telling them? Addressing the members of House of Rep, I'll be telling them, let us emphasize primary education. Review the Constitution, free and compulsory, and criminalize. There must be sanctions. Criminalize those who refuse to send their children to school. We just, we just must get it right. We just cannot have what is happening. I mean, look at what is happening in, in some parts of the northern states. The, well, the, the, the elites, Mr. President said it right. The elites caused it. And the elites are, elites are bearing the brunt now. Because if, if you refuse to give good education to a Nigerian child, it will come back to haunt you. There's just no way. The effect we're seeing now. So let's get, let's get, and that's why I'm going back again to getting the foundation right. If we get the foundation right, we will reduce the pressure on universities. Because if I identify my child to be, a good, to be good in photography and lost photography yeah. from the junior school or from the primary school, I'll work hard to send my child to a photography academy. Okay, madam. And from there, he takes it up. Okay. Three words. Two have played up. I'll play up the third one. We've played up curriculum. <clears throat> We've played up policy. Yeah. Do we have a funding problem in education? No, I can say that. No, we have leakages. Massive leakages. Despite UNESCO's 15%? <laughs> Those figures are banded up and down. I, I don't want to talk about UNESCO figures, you know. And I've always asked um, most of my colleagues, show me the documents. But that's not, that's not the discussion for today. I mean whether it is 12, whether it is and all that. But I must say, in Nigerian contemporary situation, funding of education, like you know from various sources, if those funds are adequately applied, we would have an improvement. Madam? I think, I, I think that we do need a system that is accountable to itself. And this is where we often fall short as a country in being able to ask the very tough questions around where, is, where are financial resources going? What are they being used for? And interrogating that, that system. 
So we, on the one hand, could do with more financial resources. But the question is, when the financial resources are channeled into the system, as Engineer Gaspar has said, where are the points of leakage? Are we willing to confront those points of leakage? leakage? Bearing in mind that some very political institutions and very powerful personalities are often behind the financial leakages that we see in the education system. I think it's also important to look at education from what the perspective of what education economists refer to as the education production function. So the outputs at the end of the day, the learning outcomes that you get at the end of the day, are a function or a vector of the ability of the child, the innate ability of the child, home background characteristics, and school effects. So when you want to determine where a child is going to get to, you have to look at these three broad characteristics. Now, the reality of the matter is that the home is extremely important. In fact, the home, broadly speaking, is often more important, a predictor of success, than the school. However, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that within the context of poverty and deprivation, as we have in a lot of Nigeria, the school can actually make up for the home on the condition that the most important characteristic in the school is an effective one. And what is that characteristic? It is the teacher. At school level, the teacher is the most important factor for learning outcomes. So where are our teachers coming from? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what we're looking at in terms of jam, malpractice, etc., is just the fruit that we're looking at. So let me ask you that question. Where are our teachers coming from? So our teachers are coming from a system that is very emphatic in telling us that only the lowest performers are welcome. That is where our teachers are coming from. I have met great teachers in this country. I'll be frank with you, they're not very many. Some of the best teachers that I have met in this country do not teach and not in the education sector. If that were to change, what would be your recommendation? My recommendation is we need to, first of all, revise cutoff marks. Why should the lowest cutoff marks go to education? If at the end of the day, educators are producing every other sector of the economy. Secondly, how do we change the public relations, the PR, around education? There are other countries of the world where education is a status symbol. In the 1960s and 1950s, when our parents went to school, education was a status symbol. Why can we not attract high performers into that sector? Remunerate them accordingly. We can begin to identify, there are many programs in Nigeria now that are beginning to identify high performers and bringing them systematically into the education sector. Can we institutionalize that at the public sector? Yes, we can, if we want to. It's all a question of political will. But how, how well are we coordinating that? Um, how can we coordinate your recommendation? Because it seems to suggest anyone who is looking at the education sector now that there's just too many disjoints at the moment. Obviously, obviously. I mean, the, so there's a legislative angle, there's a, uh, the policy angle, and also there's the issue of training. And then to add on to that, honestly, I must, let, me, let me reflect with you to say we need quality teachers. Unfortunately enough, the system we have today cannot <coughs> give us quality teachers. The College of Education, like she mentioned, the cut of marks are the lowest. Again, the issue with, with the College of Education is the fact that, which she, has, she didn't mention, is the fact that there are programs called pre NCE. Pre NCE requires four passes. Four passes in one year, you move to the NCE proper. Four passes four, I mean, at YX level. Four passes. It's like a prelim. It's like a prelim. <clears throat> and then you move into the NCE. I mean, for God's sake, for such a student or candidate, the, that, that foundation is wobbly. No matter what you are taught in one year, you cannot remedy a very, very weak foundation. And we expect that person in the next four years to go in front of a classroom mm. to deliver mathematics, mm. to deliver English. It's just not possible. Engineer Gaspar, there's something she said about this 50-year uh, uh, conversation that's uh, yeah. hanging. Yeah. What do we need to do now, and who is championing this negotiation? Who is championing this conversation? We've been having interventions, and there are several interest groups talking about education and all of that. Who, uh, how do we circumvent this, break this 50-year cycle, and move Nigeria forward a lot faster than we're going? Well, I'm happy about that. We've, we've had islands of 
discussions here and there. And I'm also very happy that this is the front burner of the president himself now. Honestly, yesterday was one of my happiest days based on the statement from uh, Mr. President. So if anything, it must be a directive from Mr. President himself to say, look, we need to sit down, we need a roundtable, we need a summit, we need everybody. The last time we did this was 50 years. Please come over, let's talk education. And let's talk education in two weeks, do the coalition. Those that have to do with legislation should be passed to the National Assembly. Those that have to do with policy, with the relevant ministries and other stakeholders. Those that have to do with funding, seek for our funds and every other thing. Within two years, when we do this, we we'll would have the, 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 the correct map. We we'll have the correct education map, which at the end of the day, what will come? Because 21st century, <laughs> it's um, economy, it's knowledge and skill, it's innovation, it's technology, it's entrepreneurship. Madam? So anything outside that? Any I'm thankful that that conversation has already begun by, you know, a group of concerned public and private sector, you know, institutions and organizations. To say that we do need this conversation that engineer is referring to, we do need to be very strategic about how we rethink <coughs> education um, as a vector of human capacity development, uh, as a vector of the preparation of the country to participate in the knowledge economy. Um, we do not need to wait for another civil war. The last time we, we had this conversation, it came on the back of a civil war. Why do we need to wait for another one before we have another conversation about this? The country is boiling across the entire... We had this conversation, didn't we, engineer? The country is boiling. In the north, it's boiling. In the east, in the west, it's south. It's boiling everywhere. So these are urgent issues. We're not speaking because it sounds nice to say, or oh, these are important things to say. These are urgent issues, and we need to take them very, very seriously if we are going to continue to be a nation. Because the nation is fragmenting. Because people do not have a sense of hope. There is no inspiration gradually. And so it is important to have this conversation. Okay. That as the entity called Nigeria, where are we going? Now, Doctor, what would you, in your final thoughts, say about... Um trying to see that we bridge that gap between the private schools, primary schools, and the public schools. Can we have a situation where we have a switch such that parents feel more confident sending their children to public primary schools? We conducted a study a few years ago, and we wanted to understand why low-fee private schools were on the rise in Lagos State. At the time, the data suggested that there were 12,082 private schools in Lagos State, as opposed to about 1,500 public schools. And so we went into some of these mushroom schools, terrible facilities in some of them, and we talked to parents. And parents would say things to us like, the school really cares about my child. This teacher really cares about my child. If my child doesn't come to school today, they're going to pick up the phone and they're going to call. This school is very close to my home, so my child who's six or seven can easily walk to school. Basically, what they were telling us is that there are characteristics of private schools, whether they are low fee or they are high fee, that are not being mirrored in the public sector. So it is important for us to begin to rethink whether we need this pure public provision model in Nigeria, or whether there is room for us to begin to introduce some practice that has now been established as very good global practice, around public-private partnerships. So that some of the factors that influence this voting of, of the feet into private sector can begin to be replicated in the government schools. Who are government teachers accountable to? Those are the people whose interests they will serve. And if those people are not the children and their parents, it may be difficult for you to achieve the sort of voting of the feet that you see in the private sector. That's not to say the private sector is perfect. Of course not. There is no system that is perfect. What you do is identify what is working. What is working in the private sector. And then ask yourself, how can we begin to transfer some of that dynamic into the government? Gasper? Well, absolutely. She's, she's absolutely right. I mean, 
the most uh, be an interface between the public and private. I mean, she gave a good statistics, which most people don't realize that we have more <laughs> private schools in Lagos than public. And um, but I must say something here, closing, to say that the 21st century education is an innovation education. And, you know, currently we have the basic, the secondary, the tertiary, and all that. And innovation education, whether we like it or not, it's here with us. No classrooms, no mortars, no bricks, no unions, no ASU, no NASU. You know, it's reality. It's a young boy with his laptop, very strong Wi-Fi, connected to the digital world, and is there learning and producing digital images, digital maps, and everything commercial. That is innovation education, 21st century education, it's which totally we must all really, which we must, I must commend you. And we uh, must embrace as well. So uh, we've been speaking to Mr. Olaomi Gasper so much. Thank you so much indeed for talking to us. The former rector of Lagos State Polytechnic, as well as Dr. Modupe Adifesho, Olateju, a policy expert. She's also been the chair, uh, vice chairs, uh, as a matter of fact, of the technical committee we designed and organized the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, uh, NES 20, on education held in 2014. Always incisive, having both of you to have uh, discussions around education with us. We hope that uh, in due course we'll be able to call you again because this is very topical. Many thanks indeed for talking to us.